to my count, 17 NBA teams of the 30 have a wildcat on the team right now. Like, is it a burden keeping tabs on all these guys? No, every morning I get a uh, sheet on my desk that tells me how they did, if their team won, what they did, because you can now you could stay by a, a, a text. Like, I can hit them. And so, no, we have 35 guys in the league, but we had 17 guys in the playoffs. You know who called me yesterday? Shay Alexander's mom, Shar, out of the blue, called me. Mm. And we talked for about 30 minutes and so proud of uh, Jamal sat with his father in Denver. I'm I'm going to the game tonight. Nice. Um, you know, I got Bam and, and mm-hmm. Tyler Hero on the other team. I don't think Tyler will play, but, um, you know, so I am going to be there. So how about Jamal? It, it's incredible. You know, having the injuries, you know, people throw stones at him at times, and he just – he bows his neck, chip on his shoulder, here I come. Yeah, it's been a treat to watch. Obviously, we have a, a real strong rooting interest in what Jamal Murray's doing in the NBA Finals and what he's done as a playoff performer. But I got to ask you, like – you know, you're you're taking in all this talent and you're trying to mold talent and you're working every day to trying to, you know, put a really great product on the floor, but also mold the next generation of NBA players. It's a lot to sort of take in and it's a big responsibility. But with Jamal specifically, like why, why was he someone that was on your radar initially? And how much did he change from that first kid that you met to the one that went on to the NBA and the one who's making a statement here in the NBA finals? Well, when I saw him, he was like sneaky, athletic, uh, big hands and feet, and I'm watching him and uh, feel for the game, um, had all kind of ways of scoring, and uh, when we got him, we needed him to score baskets for us. Now, I don't think anyone scored for me more. Now, you think about all these guys. You think about all these guys I have. He scored more points per game than anybody I've coached. Think Mm. about that. Mm. Uh, at Kentucky in my my time here. But I'll give you a great story. You know, he's ambidextrous. People may not know that. So we're practicing. He drives left with his left hand. Falling down, flips a ball up. I, boop, Jamal, what kind of shot was that? Says, I can make that. I said, are you out of your mind? Come on, man. You can't. So in the bubble, when they're in the playoffs, he made one of those. And texted me after and said, I told you I could make that. I mean, it was, he's just a smile on his face every day. When he walked in, I was in the gym, I walk in, he'd point to his smile, telling me to smile. Mm. Um, parents, great people. I mean, they raised him, they, you know, geez, he, they kept him away from the TV. I mean, he was a focused driven um let me give you this and I, I hate to just talk but they're playing in denver and they're getting beat pretty good against miami he comes down and makes two threes now it's a three-point game 14 seconds to go he got it i'm sitting there and i said he's shooting this ball i don't care what they do he will shoot it because he loves that moment and he came down and shot it. Now, he missed it. But those are the players that are in the different stratosphere. They're not afraid to miss the game, tying, game winning in the championship game. He wasn't afraid. Next game, he triple doubles. Didn't affect him in one bit. That shows you how good he is. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I think you just answered uh, the next question I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you, like, why Why was he your leading scorer? Why was he the guy putting up all those shots? Was it, you know, just a product of the team you had? Is it just what he was to you guys? Or is it just someone who's not scared of the moment? Someone who wants to take the shot? Someone who wants to have the ball in his hand at all times? I feel like, you know, that's the answer to the question. There's something about Jamal Murray that's different is that he's not afraid of letting the ball fly. That and and the fact that he's skilled enough to make it. Now, I'm telling you, I've only seen him one time where his confidence waned a little bit, and that was, uh, I can't remember, I'm in Charlotte sitting there with his father, and it's the preseason, and he's 0 for 12 for the preseason in threes. 
and he comes over with these big eyes. I can't make a shot. And I, and I said, dude, just keep shooting. You know you're a scorer and a shooter shoot. So that game, he missed his first four. And all four, he looks over at me and puts his hand up. Do you see this? And then he started making shots, and it gets behind him. But he has such confidence. But it's from competence and his work. That's why he's confident, not delusional. He's confident. And you know what? It takes more than that. It takes your team being confident in you. And they are. Jokic is ridiculous, by the way. I, I've never seen anything like it. But he and Jamal really respect each other. And the other guys know on the team, and they respect what Jamal can do. When you're playing with someone of that caliber, I feel like there's even a, a competition, like a constructive competition. You look beside you, it's Jokic. It's someone that is, as you said, ridiculous, like out of this league in terms of what he can do. I, Jamal seems like a guy that will want to put himself in that conversation, will want to be in the limelight, will want to be competitive to be, hey, let's both get triple doubles. I'm not shying away from the moment. There is one superstar. Why can't it be two? It seems like he's got that mentality playing along someone that is one of the best in the world. Do, do you see that with him as well, that he holds himself accountable to the best in the league and wants to put himself in that conversation? Yeah, but not in a selfish way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love what Jokic said. Do you love passing more than shooting or shooting more than passing? He said, well, when I pass, I make two people happy. <laughs> when I shoot, I make me happy. Mm -hmm. And so he said, I'd probably rather pass. Jamal's one of those guys that has a competitive spirit, not the guy he's playing with, the guy he's playing against. Like, he literally will say, I'm as good as any player in this league and go take the lie detector test, and, and it'll say, yep, he's telling the truth. Mm -hmm. He believes that. And that's what makes him what he is. I mean, you know, he – but he hadn't changed. I'm in Denver. I'm sitting fourth row up. He goes through the court, walks up the steps, and gives me a hug. Come on. <laughs> come on. What? I mean, and I saw him coming. I said, he ain't going to come over here. And, and, you know, but I've got, listen, how about Shea? I know we're talking about Jamal. How about mm -hmm. Shea? How about this name? Another Canadian, Trey Lyles. What did he do this year in Sacramento? He became the third guy. Now, the other two were Malik Monk and De'Aaron Fox, two of my guys, and then him. But in the playoffs, he was the one that was the difference maker. Yeah, we, we have to keep with the Canadian connection. Shea, certainly next up on our list in terms of the, the conversation where we want to shift it as well as, as you saw him early on in his career. What was his? What were your expectations from him? He wasn't even a starter at the beginning of the season when he joined Kentucky and then where he's been able to be risen to now at this point. He's synonymous with the greatest and he's doing a lot of things that Canadian basketball players have never done. Um, just the rise you've seen from Shea in your time and now him in the NBA. I'll tell you this. Um, we're about six games in, five games in, and I'm not starting him. And the more I'm seeing him, I'm like, this kid's better than I thought. And all of a sudden, I call him in and I said, you know what, Shay, you should be starting, but we're winning right now. Let me ride this thing out. He goes, stop, coach. I trust you. You do what you, you need to do. I'm fine. I'll do. Well, within the 10th game, I start him, and then the rest is kind of history. But his mother, when he played well, I tell the story. We laughed about it yesterday. I said, do you remember calling me when he played well? And he said, she said, coach, I know my son. He's playing well. You stay on him. Stay on him. Keep pushing him. She didn't call me after he didn't play as many minutes. She never called me that I wasn't starting him. She was calling me to make sure I hold him accountable. And she was that way throughout. So I think it, he got had a different – he was different that way. Um, he was never phased. He was so – his demeanor was so even. Um, he, his shot had a little click in it. We had to work on that. But his ability to score baskets, but just as important, his size let him see everything. And by the end of the year – he was a lottery pick. And you may not know this, 
that there was a team that was going to draft him earlier. And he said, nope, I'm not going there. Tell him I'm not going. I looked at him. I said, are you out of your mind? You go, who picks you? Nope, I'm not going there. And it all played out. I mean, the Clippers never wanted to trade him. But Oklahoma City said, if you want this guy, we need Shea, or we're not doing the trade. So they had no choice. But they did not want to move him. You get him on your team, you give him a max deal, you give him the super max, and you say, that's the culture we want. Yeah, he's an incredible player. He's one of our favorites for sure. Uh, I would never forgive the. It wasn't the Raptors, but I would never forgive them if they were the ones that uh, <laughs> didn't convince Shea that that was the good landing no, spot. No, it, was, it wasn't. The, it wasn't the Raptors. No, they were too good back then. It wasn't then. the Raptors. No, no. Uh, okay, so you know, since you started like recruiting, uh, not that this is at the forefront of your mind at all times, but the change in Canadian basketball has to have been absolutely immense. Like the most, most of the best players for, in my understanding, at least they're going and playing high school basketball in the States, but they start here in Canada and they figure out where they're going from there. But the amount of talent coming out of Canada right now, it must be unrecognizable from where you first started and you were first recruiting and you were first looking at talent North of the border. So I'll just ask you about the level, but also how important the pipeline from Canada has been when you're putting together your teams. Well, I, I would say we're talking about some of the best players in the NBA. I'd be – why aren't every Canadian player coming with us? I don't know that. But here's what I would say. I coached the Dominican national team, Dominican Republic. We played against Canada. And at the time, you know, they had good coaches. Kelvin Sampson was one of the assistants on there. But the more I watched – and then I saw the guys that were going to be the Wiggins and all these guys coming through. I said, Canada's going to medal in the Olympics. They just got to get the politics out of this, get their best players on there, and roll with it. Because they can medal in the Olympics. Can they beat the USA? I don't know. Because I don't know who'd be on that team. But I will tell you, you'll have a team full of NBA players. And I've been right. I mean, I, I don't know if they've meddled. I haven't stayed on top of that. But my guess is the national team has gotten better and better um, because of who they have in the pipeline. Well, that's another thing to love about Shea Gilgis Alexander because he seems to be one of the guys who wants to carry the flag. Uh, we are talking to John Calipari, head coach of the Kentucky Wildcats and former coach of many of the greatest talents in the NBA right now. I got to ask you about a future talent in Case and Wallace because there has been some reporting that the Raptors may be interested in Case and Wallace. If Case and Wallace is a Raptor, what's he going to bring to an NBA team? Oh, you will love him. You will love him. He's another one. Look, he's one that I'm going to tell teams, you pass on this kid. I told teams they passed on Maxi and quickly probably 10 teams for each passed on him, on those two. And I said, you will regret the day you passed on these two. And now you look at Maxi and quickly. Maxie's, geez, he's going to be a max deal. But I say Case and Wallace because what your league has become is positionless. So, first of all, he can guard three positions, and physically he can do it. He's got an unde unbelievable demeanor about him. And I'll tell you this, I played him a lot at point guard. But he doesn't have to be a point guard. He could be off the ball and do just as well, which is what my guards do up there. They can, yes, have the ball or be off the ball. They're not afraid to give it to other people because they played basketball positionless. You're not locked into one. He can, I'll I tell you, the, the, the stuff with him, one of the great kids, great family, um, laughed at my jokes, understood <laughs> my jokes. Um, but he's uh, <laughs> Toronto. The fans, just like Maxi became a favorite in Philadelphia, if he's in Toronto, oh, he'll be a favorite. <laughs> well, he'll be one of the favorites. Well, uh Coach, you are coming up to Toronto for Global Jam uh, next month. Wildcats are representing the United States here in the tournament. Why is it best for your team to come up? What do you hope to gain from this experience next month? Well, let me tell you what I'm disappointed in. First of all, I love Toronto. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite cities in the world. In the world. Mm -hmm. It's a great city. But what I'm disappointed 
Drake is not going to be in Toronto. He's touring. I'm like, what's going on? You could give him a call. He'd listen to you. To, I, I, want, I want to go sleep at his house and practice in his gym. What's going on up there? But he's he's out of town. You know I already checked that. No, this is, this is one of those things, the Global Jam, older teams, 23-year-olds. I'm going to have a very young team, talented team, a fun team to watch. But this is an experience to say, where are we right now? And knowing that we don't have a whole lot of time to prepare because it's July 9th when we're going up there, and they're just getting to campus now. We'll have 10 days of practice with a brand-new team, and here we go. But it's going to be a talented young team. It'll be uh, – we'll have fun. It's going to be a great experience for us to learn where we are. Um, hard for us, you know, to win games against – basically professional teams with the, with the team we have. But you know what? It'll be a great ex- experience. I just got one last quick one for you here, Coach. Um, I played college sports before NIL had entered this, the, the atmosphere, and I, I'm a little jealous of what goes on down south nowadays. But what's the biggest challenge of, of coaching through the new processes and realities of what NIL brings to your players? And I'm sure Kentucky Wildcats men's basketball team gets a lot of interest in terms of sponsorship deals. Is there anything that has come up as a challenge um, early on in this uh, new regime? Well, it's not why you come to Kentucky. We're talking about 50 guys in the league, $4 billion in salary. I mean, mm-hmm. you come here for that, but it's better here than anybody anywhere else. Our our program, we don't flout it. We don't throw things out there about it. But our kids do well from us. But more importantly, being an athlete here, they now have Kentucky behind them. So many of them have – their agents have unbelievable deals away from what we do. But, you know, my thing is, again, you come here for basketball. And if you, you don't trip over nickels trying to get to a max deal, you just don't. But our kids do better, uh, have done better, will continue to do better. Uh, this year probably will be one of those years because we've got these freshmen that are really talented and they'll have their own trading card deals and all the other stuff that they'll have aside from what the university, uh, or it's not really the university, what we're putting together. Our our fans, we got the best fans in the country. We've got people that are engaged and involved and, um, you know, so now it's, but it is different. And, and, you know, let, let me just say this. If they're like, that's their number one thing, name, image, and likeness. I'm like, why would you come here? I'm not, the principles I live by, I'm not changing. It's been good for players. It's been good for the programs where I've coached. It's been good for me and the staff. And you know what? I sleep good at night. So we're going to stick with what we're doing. And we got some adjustments. We're doing some things. The, the transfer portal, you know, we've got to be more, uh, deliberate because I've got players trying to see if they're going to be draftable. So we got to really wait until that clears. So we're more deliberate, but we're still going to do well. Um, we're still going to be that team. I mean, the kids that come here do well. Mm-hmm. You sure do. And uh, your team has uh, great aspirations again this year and looks like you'll have a loaded roster. We really appreciate you taking the time. Enjoy your trip up to Toronto next month. We'll try to we'll try to get Drake uh, figured out for you. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely keep you keeping close tabs on you and enjoy watching the rest of the NBA playoffs and the, the players that you help mold into who they are. Thank you. Appreciate that. We'll chat soon. Uh, John Calipari, head coach of the Kentucky Wildcats men's basketball team. And of course, uh, coach of many, many superstars that are performing quite well in the NBA Finals.